Welcome back. This is the second video cast about the Wild Chile of the Central Andean Highlands and also the manuscript that records uh, the cosmological memory of the Wild Chile peoples. And so in this video cast, we're going to look at the cosmovision of the Wild Chile in more detail. But before I start, I'm going to put a question to you. Um, we might discuss this in the seminars, but it doesn't do any harm to just mention it now so you can think about it. If you read the Warachiri manuscript, or if you've read it, is it fair to say you can see evidence of a Pan-Andean cosmovision? Obviously, I'm going to try and give you some hints but, to this uh, shortly, but think about this. Is it even fair to say that you can see a Pan-Indigenous American cosmovision? So he's not just Andean, but also broaden it out beyond the Andes to see something that... that uh, is common to more indigenous peoples beyond the Andes. So yeah, did you notice any commonalities with anything you've read from previous weeks? So for the Warachiri manuscript, I'd recommend, uh, if you're reading it in English, I'd recommend the edition by Frank Solomon and George Oriost. And they've edited and translated the text. And in the introduction, they highlight one uh, one commonality called the revolt of the objects. And Salomon draws a direct parallel with the popal verb, the Kiche Maya. So uh, again, there's different tr uh, translations that you can use, but I use the edition uh, translated by Dennis Tedlock, and I'll quote from that now, in which the popal verse says, uh, regarding the revolt of the object, it goes something like this. Uh, they were pounded to the bones and down. Sorry, they were pounded down to the bones and tendons, smashed and pulverized even to the bones. Their faces were smashed because they were incompetent before their mother and their father, the heart of sky named Hurricane. The earth was blackened because of this. The black rainstorm began, rain all day and rain all night. Into their houses came the animals, small and great. Their faces were crossed by things of wood and stone. Everything spoke their water jars, their tortilla griddles, their plates, their cooking pots, their dogs, their grinding stones. And this is the grinding stone. We were undone because of you. Every day, every day in the dark, in the dawn, forever. Rip, rip, rub, rub, right in our faces because of you. This is the service we gave you at first when you were still people. But today you will learn of our power. We shall pound and we shall grind your flesh, their grinding stones told them. So yeah, that's the popover. And this is referring to the destruction of the wood people. Because remember, they couldn't keep time. They, did, they didn't uh, have a calendar. They didn't remember to worship the creator deities when they should have done. So the gods uh, took umbrage at this and they destroyed them. Now if we go back to the Warachiri manuscript, that reads, In ancient times the sun died. Because of his death it was night for five days. Rocks banged against each other. Mortars and grinding stones began to eat people. So think about the Popol Vuh and the grinding stones uh, killing the people there. Mortars and grinding stones began to eat people. Bakliyama started to drive men. So in the previous chapter, this, this was chapter 4 of the Wajiri manuscript, in, in chapter 3, it ta also talks about a flood in which the ocean overflowed and that when it retreated all the way down again, it exterminated all, all the people. And that's a quotation. So it's an almost uncanny parallel in the two texts. So you might ask, okay, what's going on? How are they linked? Now I'm not putting these two texts together to suggest in some way the Mayan people at some stage in their civilizational development were actually in contact with the coastal people of Peru. I'm not uh, saying this with any confidence at all. Although I do actually have a vague record. This is something for you, you can for your own research. I've got to have a recollection, a vague recollection last year that I read a press release about gold found in a cenote. So this is a sacred water hole in, in Maya, Yucatan. And that gold object originated from coastal Peru. So the obvious implication is that, that there were at some point trade links that connected the two uh, civilizations or two groups of people. Um, but rather unsatisfactorily, I've not been able to find anything else on it or verify it and I can't find the article that I'm vaguely remembering. So if you want to follow it up, um, it, it could be quite interesting. All we've got to go on for the moment then 
are these strangely parallel excerpts in these unconnected sacred texts. And we've got an explanation, in fact, by the Warachi narrator. Um, so that can be our starting point. So the Warachi narrator, he explains, the flood comes from the biblical story of Noah, while the extinction of the sun comes from the scriptural description of the darkness that came over the earth when Jesus was crucified. So the biblical uh, understanding of this is that these were universal events. So whether or not the people were Christian, they would have happened everywhere. Yeah, uh, and that's how the the Warachiri narrator understands stands it. Um, so that can be our starting point. If you want, you can apply a more modern critical uh, uh, analysis to this, um, and come up with an eminently workable hypothesis that perhaps Christianity did indeed influence two indigenous myths or two indigenous memories rather than myths uh, in similar ways, drawing them together. So you have Christianity influencing the way the Popol Vuh was remembered, and you have Christianity influencing the way uh, the Warachiri uh, was, uh, origin uh, stories were remembered too. Remember, both of these are recorded in writing after Christianity reached the places in question. So we're talking about almost 100 years for, well, 70 years for um, the Wara Chiri and uh, 1700 odd, so yeah, n nearly 200 years for for um, for the Wara Chiri manuscript. Sorry, the Popol Vuh. It's nearly 200 years for the Popol Vuh. So yeah, there's a good chance that Christianity has influenced the way these texts, uh, these these uh, origin stories are remembered but this isn't the whole story and I'll say why now if you go back in time much further back in time to roughly AD 650 um, you might remember that date from earlier sessions on the coast of Peru in the northern coast of Peru you have uh, an advanced civilization called the Morcha and they peak and decline uh, again roughly 650 to 700 AD. Uh, this is European Western time. And there's another remarkable parallel here in that this collapse occurred round about the same time as the collapse of Teotihuacan in central Mesoamerica and also the collapse of Caminaljuyu of the Maya in what is now Guatemala. So, yeah, you. Uh, w you might ask, oh, okay, what's going on there? Well, there is an interesting explanation for, for the parallel collapse of these three civilizations, and that is a climactic disaster caused by a catastrophic volcanic eruption uh, in El Salvador um, that's been proven to have happened uh, uh, in, in this time, um, and that, uh, they think, caused uh, a two-year winter, uh, which caused massive floods uh, and crops to fail and famine and leading to the uprising of the people against uh, their leaders who were supposed to be uh, in, com in, co in communication with the gods and able to control the weather as a result. Yeah, so um, these civilizations all collapsed around about the same time. Now the Mocha, they're important to us here and now because that civilization left a very very tangible mark on subsequent coastal civilizations uh, of Peru such as the Chimu of the north coast and uh, which basically uh, grew uh, to its height in the late 14th to early 15th centuries again European time that is um, and was then conquered by uh, the Incas and assimilated into Tahuantinsuyo and also the Yunca of the central coast uh, the Chimu uh, civilization grew pretty much in the same place as the Mocha civilization um, the Yunca fair the south the Yunca is central to the Warachiri stories now the Mocha also have iconography um, uh, and this has been this archae archaeological evidence of this which tells of the death of the sun and the revolt of the object. So that's what's described in the Warachiri manuscript. 
So these are material things belonging to humans rising up and slaughtering them, basically. So this phenomenon of the revolt of the objects on the coast of Peru, it predates the arrival of Christianity by at least a thousand years, at least. So, um, yeah, we've got the Warachiri Manuscripts narrator saying that, uh, or giving a biblical explanation for this phenomena, um, and a critical historical interpretation of that, that that might be applied, is that indigenous memory was influenced by subsequent arrival of Christianity, but still, we need to qualify that. Um, the narrator framed in biblical terms something that existed in indigenous memory long prior to Christianity's arrival on the South American continent. This event was already documented uh, before Christianity got there. So it's essentially a cataclysm. Um, it's a turning over of normal natural society and its destruction. This is the world upside down. So in the Andes, it's a pachacuti, um, a turning over of, of the world. It's, a, it's chaos and destruction before things can begin again. We don't actually need to link the indigenous American civilizations causally, although I still think it's really interesting that these major civilizations, Teotihuacan, Caminal Juyu, and the Mocha, all collapse cataclysmically at roughly the same time. So mm, you might want to do that. It, ca it can possibly be done, but I'm not doing it here. Um, what I'm going to do is link them uh, cosmologically. We're talking about cycles. That's what links these cosmovisions together. You've got the sowing and dawning in the Popolver of the Maya. You've got the destruction and rebirth in the, uh, of the Central American Meso the, sorry, the Central Mesoamericans. So this is the Aztecs, the Nahua peoples. And here in that Huarachiri manuscript, well, it's perhaps not quite as obvious as uh, in the Mesoamerican memories, but it's there all the same. These cycles, they really do form the framework of the whole text. It's just that they're different in the way that it, to, to, to those you see in the Aztec uh, memories or the Popol Vuh, in the, in the Mayan memories. Essentially, what we're talking about, yes, is, is, is it's agricultural cycles. But in particular, if we think about Huarochiri, it's important to envisage the landscape, the very vertical landscape of where we're talking about. So if we start at the very top of this vertical landscape, you've got the high frozen sierra, and that's where the god Pariacaca is found. Then you've got, uh, as you move a bit further down, you've got more verdant mountain slopes as the, as the ice melts away. Um, you've got grasslands for grazing, then the grasses uh, give away, uh, they give way to mountain woodland as you descend further. But as you approach the coast, this natural greenery, it dries up completely um, into a very barren uh, wasteland. A very, almost, it looks, looks almost Martian, as you can see from these images, uh, these photographs that I took uh, quite a long time ago now. Um, it, yeah, it's a barren uh, landscape of rock and sand. But despite it being very barren, this barrenness is due to lack of water. The earth itself is extremely fertile. All it needs is water. So the most important cycles, as they're described in the Huarachiri manuscript, are about water cycles, the irrigation cycles, because the water it, in the form of deities, male deities, that is, so you've got Kuni Raya Viracocha, he's, just, he's at the early part of the Huarachiri manuscript, and then a bit later on you've got Pariacaca, these deities rush down. There's, they, they, they manifest themselves as storms in the highlands, and then they become rivers further down. And they have sexual relations with the female wakas, the patron deities of the youngers. And the waters mix with the earth, and they produce fruit. And this is not just a euphemism. This is, a, this is the reality. And the rivers then rush down into the sea and mix with the sea. And the sea, in turn, is female, mama kocha. And so that's the descent. But you might be thinking, okay, well, that's not a cycle. That's just moving one way. What about the other half? Well, you can see it 
in the flood episode that's described in the manuscript in which a llama or the llama um, warns that the ocean will overflow and just as a detail um, this warning by the by the llama uh, it might be interpreted as divination, a, div a divination practice. So the sacrifice of a llama and then the, the animal would be opened up and the entrails would be examined uh, to look for omens of uh, cataclysm or, or good fortune or bad fortune. And that this was one way of uh, divining omens. But there is a much grander explanation that relates to a section in the World Chile manuscript further on, and that describes the water cycle in its entirety. So, the flood that the Lama warns about is a disruption in that cycle. How so? Well, the Lama, or the Llama, that's a negative constellation in the Milky Way. You might ask, well, what do I mean by a negative constellation? So, um, Western uh, astronomy or Western astrology, even both perhaps, uh, talk about constellations uh, joining the dots of the stars themselves, and that comes, I guess, it goes all the way back to the Greek way of doing things. Um, but indigenous American uh, astronomy and astrology, uh, the ba the boundaries were quite blurry uh, way back when. Um, and just American astro astronomy more often tends not to link the stars so the light points it links the it picks out shapes of darkness that are between the stars so a negative constellation is the darkness but de de it's devoid of stars so if you think back to the Popol Vuh it talks about the hero twins taking the black road to uh to Sibalba, the, 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 the underworld, the place of the dead. And that the black road is the Milky Way. And you think, well, how is the Milky Way black? I mean, it's, it's surely, it's, we call it the Milky Way because it's, it's full of light, uh, it's full of stars. Yeah, if you look at the stars. But if you look closely at the image of the Milky Way, um, it's got a big dark... Uh, line in the middle of it a kind of and that is the black road um so yeah it's just a different way of looking at the same thing um and that's a negative constellation so the llama itself is um a negative constellation within the milky way um so anyway in the world Chile manuscript it descends at certain times it's described as descending at certain times of the year uh, it drinks from the ocean and then it ascends up the milky way which is the astral river and it takes the water with it and it rises back up to the mountains and the rainy season begins again so actually if you think about it it's not too far from the scientific water cycle that we uh, that we think is true today so basically yeah uh, the w uh, water is evaporated from the ocean uh, as it rises uh, it m hits the mountains uh, uh, because it's rising it cools down and uh, it condenses and then falls as rain, falls as rain in the mountains, and then uh, enters the rivers and descends all the way back to the sea. So that's the that's the scientific uh, water cycle that we follow today. Well, you've just seen it described uh, as a llama drinking from the ocean, taking it back up to the mountains where it falls as rain. Now, so what happens in the flood? The llama. Um, doesn't actually reach the ocean to drink it. It overflows uh, with, all, and all the water, the water descend that descends from the mountains floods the land because there's nowhere for it to go. Again, scientifically, you can see that um, you've got atmospheric changes, large, devastating cyclical weather phenomena such as El Nino. They can, in fact, be predicted by a close observation of the stars. And what I'm not saying, necessarily, is that the movement of stars causes the events here on Earth, although for the people of the time, that causal link was def definitive. What I'm saying is that the changes in climate will affect the way that heavens can be seen from the Earth. Um, it's 
yeah scientifically what you what you're seeing refraction of light uh, so the llama shifts its position because of the humidity and the, uh, the extra humidity in the air that's evaporating off the sea because of El Nino and it doesn't actually reach the sea to drink it so anyway the llama doesn't reach the ocean to drink it, it over, the, the ocean overflows the water descends from the mountains and therefore there's huge floods uh, it's either a causal link, so the heavenly llama doesn't drink enough water from the ocean, so the land floods as the rainwater has nowhere to go, or it's a semiotic indication of real phenomena. So what I mean by that is basically um, the, the fact that the constellation that, that the fact that the constellation doesn't reach the sea is a warning sign that there's something different about the atmosphere. So as we would understand it, excess humidity causing light refraction. Um, and that indicates in turn that it's likely to rain cats and dogs. Uh, uh, that's a metaphor, by the way. I'm not, uh, yeah. Um, so we are more likely to understand the llama's position in the sky semiotically, so as a sign of something that's happening climactically. But our Andean protagonists, they're likely to understand the position of the llama both causally and also semiotically as a sign as a sign to batten down the hatches so to speak because they they it they can take it as a warning uh it has cause and effect but also it's a sign that something bad is going to happen so it's both causal and semiotic for our andean protagonists so there's a difference in interpretation here okay so that brings me to the end of my very brief discussion of the cosmology of the Warachiri and just to stress that the key cycle in the Warachiri manuscript is the water cycle. So the male water gods rush down from the heights and irrigate the female earth goddesses. That sounds creepy but it's not actually a euphemism although it could easily be one. Um, what you're seeing here is a highland lowland male female duality that you see throughout the Andes. And when we look at the Incas, we'll talk a bit more about the, that duality in detail. Without that duality, no life would be possible. So the water then is carried back up to the highlands by the divine Lama who, who drinks from the sea. So you've got an all important cycle in which, this is important, dualities play an intrinsic part. So again, this is a commonality between indigenous American cosmovisions. And that's where I'll end this particular video cast.